So here we are. This is it. Today and next week, and then you're done with me. Then uh, Jesse moves in and, uh, and takes over. No, be excited. It's a good, it's a good thing. Um, so uh, it, the other thing I want to tell you is, if you look at the, the bulletin that we gave you, uh, there's a title for the series for today on it, and Sue Little, who does our, our communication stuff and puts this together, she asked me on Wednesday, Todd, are you sure this is what you're doing this Sunday? And I said, yes. She said, Todd, are you sure? And I said, yes. And then I went home, and I went, you know what? I'm not doing that. Uh, I'm going to do something else. Because it occurred to me that I only have two Sundays left with you guys, so I want to kind of tie those two, these last two Sundays together and uh, kind of go off the page a little bit. So, Sue, I apologize to you. And I wish I'd known I was going to do this before Wednesday because I would have uh, given you some questions in advance, and, and maybe we would do the cards where you guys turn them in, and, and we'd see what your answers to these questions would be. But... Uh, I want to just start by throwing a couple of questions out, uh, starting with this one. If you could capture a moment in time in your life, a moment from your life and relive it, which moment would you choose? You know, you might have to think about that for a while. But, would, you know, depending on what moment you think about, would you do anything differently in that moment? I have some moments where I would do some things differently, for sure. Um, I might relive the, the first time I met Kara, right? The first time I met my wife. Obviously, uh, I was on Kara's radar long before she was uh, on mine. And why not? Because look at, at the good-looking specimen which stands before you this morning. How could I not have been on her radar? So, so her first pickup line to me was, I'm walking through uh, the commons in college on our campus, and she says, hey, you want to come with me to fix my truck? No. Uh, and I... And I moved on, and that was it. I missed the opportunity there to uh, meet my wife. For the f I kind of met her, but I blew her off. Like, you know, I'm not very handy, so I don't think so. That's not a very good pickup line, though. Do you want to help me fix my truck? Not a, not a good one. I might revisit that uh, life encounter, or life uh, changing encounter I had with my grandfather. Uh, I might just want to go back and relive that and tell my grandfather what I didn't say in, in that time. Some of you know that story. Just to tell him how much I, I love him and value him and appreciate what that moment meant to me and what it meant for the rest of my life. So years ago, I read a book by Erwin McManus, who's a pastor down in L.A., uh, called Seizing Your Divine Moment. And in that book, McManus asked this question. He says, what if there was a moment, a defining or a divine moment, where the choices you made determine the course and momentum of your future? How would you treat that moment? How would you prepare for it? I think we would all treat that moment as though our lives depended on it, wouldn't we? We would hope to. We'd prepare for it, we'd study for it, and when that moment came our way, we would already have decided in advance how we would seize that divine moment and make the most of the opportunity that presented itself to us, right? The thing is, we can't usually see defining moments. We can't usually see divine moments before they come our way. God typically doesn't give us a heads up long in advance you know, hey, uh, next January, you're going to have a defining moment on the 23rd at 2.30 in the afternoon. So I want you to be prepared for that, all right? God doesn't do that. God reveals the, he doesn't send us a text saying, hey, a divine moment is coming your way with a little smiley face with sticking out its tongue and winking its eye emoji at the end of it, right? He doesn't do that. God reveals our defining moments, his divine moments in the moment to us, which means we have to be prepared for that moment before it arrives, so we can seize them when they come our way. When we capture these moments, something significant happens. We're drawn into a supernatural experience where, God's, uh, where God responds to our faith with his power, where his faith, or uh, sorry, our faith and his power come together to accomplish great purposes. And God uses just regular people like us, notorious sinners who are just thirsty to be a part of the story of God, to play a role in the story of God. So capturing these moments requires a willingness on our part to take risks and to live dangerously for God. How many of us want to take risks and live dangerously? To capture these moments requires that we step into the mystery with God, that we step into the unknown and the uncertain when those divine moments come our way. How, how many of us feel good about unknown and uncertain things? How many of us feel good about unknown and uncertain outcomes in life? But this is what living for God and following Jesus is all about. It's risky and dangerous. Regardless of what anybody else told you about the will of God, 
Following God is risky and dangerous, and a lot of us don't do risky and dangerous very well. We prefer to do safe and comfortable over risky and dangerous. But if our lives are going to count for something eternal, if we're going to experience all that God is and all that being a follower of Jesus includes, then we've got to run towards the action when the moment prevent, pre presents itself. Trusting that God will help us accomplish his very best, that God will use us to accomplish his very best when we move into that moment, when we take the risk, when we enter the danger with God. So to bring this home, I want us to look at an Old Testament story in which Jonathan, King Saul's son, risks, he risks everything in a divine moment, and it was a moment that changed an out, the outcome of a war. So we're going to be in 1 Samuel 13, where Saul, the first ever king of Israel, uh, is involved here, uh, and what is left of Saul's army, they're they're battling their greatest adversary, the Philistine army. And so here's some backdrop to where we're going to start. Saul was uh, king of Israel for 42 years, from age 30 to age 72. And as we start reading, he had just taken things out of God's hands and taken control of what should have been God's himself. And in doing so, the prophet Samuel comes to him and says, you just made a huge mistake and you're going to lose, your, you're going to lose the throne because you didn't wait for God, you didn't trust God, and you took things in, under your own control. So that's, where, that's what's happening as we start reading in 1 Samuel 13. And from this point on, by the way, if you follow the life of Saul, he begins to make terrible choices, uh, and he pretty much loses it uh, at the end of his, by the end of his life. So here we are, 1 Samuel 13, 15, says this, Samuel, who is the prophet, then left Gilgal, where he had met Saul just now, and went on his way. But the rest of the troops went with Saul to meet the army. They went up from Gilgal to Gibeah in the land of Benjamin. And when Saul counted the men who were still with him, because they had thousands and thousands deserted, he found only 600 left. Saul and Jonathan and, and the troops with them were staying at Geba near Gibeah. I love these Old Testament words. In the land of Benjamin. The Philistines set up their camp at Michmash. Awesome word. Three raiding parties soon left the camp of the Philistines. One went north towards Oprah in the land of Shual. Another went toward Beth Horon. And the third moved toward the border above the valley of Zeboim near the wilderness. There were no blacksmiths, by the way. He just throws this in here. There were no blacksmiths in the land of Israel in those days. The Philistines wouldn't allow them for fear they, they the Israelites, would make swords and spears for the Hebrews. So whenever the Israelites needed to sharpen their plowshares, picks, axes, or sickles, they had to take them to a Philistine blacksmith. And it goes on to say how much it cost them. So none of the people of Israel had a sword or a spear except for the king and his son, Saul and Jonathan. The pass at Michmash had meanwhile been secured by a contingent of, Philistine, uh, of the Philistine army. And one day, Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor or his armor bearer, come on, Let's go over to, to where those Philistines have their outpost. But Jonathan did not tell his father where, what he was doing. Meanwhile, Saul and his 600 men were camped on the outskirts of Gibeah around the pomegranate tree at Migron. Among Saul's men was Ahijah, the, the priest, who was wearing the linen ephod. Ahijah was the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother. Ahitub was the son of Phinehas and the grandson of Eli, the priest of the Lord who had served at Shiloh. Now we all know that. No one realized that Jonathan had left the Israelite camp. So in an army of 600 men, only two of them had swords, Saul and Jonathan. And Saul, because of his mistakes, because the prophet had just told him, you're going to lose your throne, is now reluctant to get into the fight. So he goes and plays it safe by taking his army to Migron and camping in the shade of a pomegranate tree. It's interesting to me as he goes to a pomegranate tree that in the Old Testament there are people who run away from God, they end up under some kind of a tree. Jonah, when he didn't want to go to Nineveh, you know, at the very end he gets angry with God, he ends up under a tree. Elijah, when he's running away from God, he ends up under a solitary broom tree. Saul, when he's not doing what God wants him to do, hangs out around a pomegranate tree. I can relate to that because there are times I don't want to do what God wants me to do and I want to take the fetal position under any kind of tree, you know. And just wait it out. Jonathan, on, on the other hand, is totally unlike his father. He knew enough about the situation and he knew enough about God to know that waiting under the pomegranate tree where it was safe was not seizing the divine moment that was just in front of him. So while the rest of the army is sleeping, Jonathan grabs his armor bearer and says, come on, let's go. 
Kind of like the scene in, in Braveheart, if I can bring that up, you know, because I know you've all seen it, uh, where William, William Wallace is leaving and his friends go, where are you going? He goes, I'm going to pick a fight. So that's what Jonathan was doing. He was going to pick a fight. Verse 4, to reach the Philistine outpost, Jonathan had to go down between two rocky cliffs that were called Bozes and Sena. The cliff on the north was in front of Michmash, and the one on the south was in front of Geba. Let's go across to see those pagans, Jonathan told his armor bearer. Perhaps the Lord will help us, for nothing can hinder the Lord. <laughs> Perhaps. Right? Let's go get these guys. Maybe God will help us. Maybe not. And then he says, he, God can win the battle whether he has many warriors or only a few. It's a profound truth in those words. So there's a distinct contrast here between Saul, the father, the king, and Jonathan, the son. Saul, who had been the warrior king, had lost his edge. He had lost his willingness to enter into the game, or in this case, the war. He had become a sideliner. He neglected God's way, and he had attempted to do things his own way, and now he's on the sidelines. Now, because there were so many deserters, Saul decides his, too many deserters, his, he decides his army's too small, and he's going to wait it out. The best thing he could do was just hang out under the pomegranate. Jonathan, on the other hand, was a gamer. He was not content to sit on the sidelines. He wasn't content to wait this one out. He believed that it didn't matter whether they had 600 or 600,000 men, God could win the day if that's what God wanted to do, by many or by few. And so Jonathan was going to get in the game. He was going to seize this moment unlike his father. He was going to confront the Philistines and trust that God would help them if it was God's will for, the, for them to find his favor. So there's a difference between gamers and sideliners. Which one are you? Which one am I most of the time? Gamers want the ball, right? Russell Wilson's a gamer. Michael Jordan was a gamer. Gamers want the ball when the game is on the line. The, uh, in other, I'll just take it outside of sports, uh, gamers are willing to put their faith into action and move in the direction of God. Even when the deck seems to be stacked significantly against them, gamers go, you know what, God can still make a way. God can still do what I couldn't do on my own. And gamers are just real people who are learning how to follow Jesus, just like you and me. Uh, but they are willing to risk everything to follow Jesus. They're willing to enter into the danger to follow Jesus. And it was the spiritual gamer in Jonathan that moved him to action when everybody else was sleeping. Sideliners, on the other hand, like Saul, they don't want the ball when the game's on the line. They don't want to take the risk. They don't want to enter the danger. They want someone else to take the shot at the buzzer. They want to find a nice, safe place while the gamers do what gamers do. Michael Jordan came into the NBA when I was in 10th grade, and I followed his career until he retired and retired and then retired finally. And uh, he wanted the ball, man. He was a gamer. And he didn't want sideliners anywhere around him, right? And he was willing to take the shot. And if you remember that game against the Cleveland Cavaliers where Craig Elo, you know, who's a local guy, he just like falls apart because Jordan could make the shot, not only take the shot. He was a gamer. But he didn't want sideliners around him. He didn't trust side sideliners. He didn't trust those people who didn't want the ball. Didn't want to be in the game when they were down three with four seconds left to go. If you're a really good sideliner, though, you can make it look like you're a gamer. You can make other people think you're a gamer. You can look the part of a leader saying all the right things, speaking passionately, passionately about what other people should do while you have no intention of doing them yourself. Right? Feel free to call me out on that for the next two Sundays. Sideliners are really good at telling gamers how they should do what they need to do and criticize them when they're not doing it right. And gamers have to be careful not to let sideliners distract them or allow their criticism to keep them from living dangerously, from taking risks, from seizing the divine moments when they show up and reveal themselves. In verse 3 of 1 Samuel 13, Jonathan and his armor bearer slip out of camp without anybody realizing it. There isn't uh, this is another characteristic of a gamer. Jonathan doesn't take a poll. He doesn't wake everybody up and say, hey, I'm thinking about going up to Michmash and messing with the Philistines. Who thinks it's a good idea? That's a sideliner move, man. A sideliner would take a poll and say, what do you guys think? Knowing in advance that everybody would say, that's a bad idea. The king wants us to stay here, so you should stay here too. Oh, okay, I just, but hey, that's a heroic thought. All right, thanks, and then nothing happens. He doesn't, 
fake courage, letting other people know of his noble intentions without really having any intentions of doing what he's about to do. He just does it. He just seizes the divine moment because he was a gamer. He's, he's willing to let the sideliners sleep and move on. Oswald Chambers said, when God presents you with a moment like this, or when God presents you with a divine moment, don't confer with flesh and blood. In other words, don't ask everybody else what they think you should do. If they think what you're about to do is a good idea, because most people won't get what God's asking you to do. Because God's not asking them to do it, he's asking you to do it. So if you go to somebody else and say, hey, what do you think? They might say, that's a bad idea. And if you listen to that counsel, though getting counsel is not bad, I'm not throwing the baby out with bathwater here, but when there's a divine moment you know you should seize and you go ask 10 people their opinion, chances are nine of those 10, if not all of them, won't get it. Because God's not calling them to, dis- to seize that moment, he's calling you to seize it. So don't confer with flesh and blood is Oswald Chambers' advice. Because other people don't always get it. Asking our friends if they think it's a good idea for us to get in the game is dangerous. Because God's not calling them the same way he's calling us. And they'll never detect the sense of calling or the sense of urgency that God's placed in our heart to capture the moment and get in the game. So like Jonathan, we've got to combine what we know about our situation and what we know about God and take a risk and put our faith into action and go for it. So verse 6, Jonathan is willing to put his life on the line even though he's not sure how it's going to work out. He's not sure of the outcome. He's willing to take the risk and put himself in harm's way. He's willing to infiltrate the enemy's camp because he had a sense of the moment. He knew it was the right thing to do and he trusted God to help him. And look at what he says to his armor bearer again, two different versions. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Maybe the Lord will help us. I had this in another section of my notes. I may just repeat it again, but there's a saying that floats around Christian circles that says the safest place to be is in the center of God's will. Oh no, it isn't. Oh no, it isn't. I know of a lot of people who are in the center of God's will who uh, it cost them their lives to be there. Jesus was in the center of God's will and he was crucified. His disciples were in the center of God's will and look what happened to them. It's a whole list of people in Hebrews who were in the center of God's will, who gave their lives for being at the center of God's will. It is the best place to be, but it is by far not the safest place to be. So don't let people throw that one over you. It's a great place to be. It's the uh, living on the edge, living dangerously, entering into the risk, experiencing a wonder place to be, but it is not safe. So, He says, maybe the Lord will help us, because he knows. Maybe God won't. That's how it works with God. There are no guarantees. God doesn't usually let us know what he's going to do or how he's going to do it until the moment unfolds. He just tells us he's going to work out what's very best for us. But he doesn't tell us it's going to work out great for us. He just asks us to be ready to respond when those divine moments present themselves. And capturing the moments requires risk on our parts. It's putting action to faith and trusting that God will act on our behalf to do what's best in his eyes and for his glory. We may win the day and live to tell about it. We may win the day and not live to tell about it. One of the big, again, I wrote here's where I put it in my notes. One of the big myths is uh, the safest place to be is in the center of God's will. Not true. So when it comes to getting in the game and capturing these moments, we have to remember, as McManus says in his book, provision doesn't always precede vision. God gives us the vision and we either move or we don't. And we say what Jonathan says, perhaps if we move, God will act on our behalf. We hope we will, we trust he will because his vision came from God, but we're not sure. So we aren't always um, gonna know that things are gonna work out in our favor. We're, We're not always gonna know if we'll be safe if we follow God and capture these divine moments. So many sideliners get stuck under the pomegranate tree of their lives, whatever that pomegranate tree is, because they're afraid something bad will happen to them. So they never take the risk. This is what happens to us when our primary concern becomes our comfort and our safety, rather than following Jesus. The result is that we get stuck in the rut of the safe and the routine, and our souls and our sense of purpose and significance waste away in a slow and agonizing way. They die a slow and agonizing death. Jonathan knew that God could win the battle, but he was willing to take the risk that maybe he wouldn't survive. He knew that God wanted to win the battle over these Philistines. 
He knew that God wanted to deliver his own people, the Israelites, because the Israelites were God's chosen people. So Jonathan knew that uh, the way the Philistines treated the Israelites was the equivalent of them spitting in the face of God. So this was a moment he had to make the most of. So he and his armor bearer took the fight to the Philistines, just the two of them. It was an egregious injustice the Philistines were showing God's people. And that moved Jonathan to take action when nobody else would. He didn't need a lightning bolt or a messenger sent from heaven to tell him this is the moment to seize. There was no other option in Jonathan's mind other than to do what he's about to do, to get in the game and do something. What about us? I've been here on Sunday mornings where we've sung the song that's now like 20 years old uh, by Delirious. Um, I don't even remember the name of the song, but the, uh, the chorus of that song proclaims that we will be dancers who dance upon injustice. You know the song I'm talking about? Yeah, you do. Um, you sung it. You've been here. So when we sang that chorus, when the song first came out, that chorus gave me goosebumps, man. I remember where I was. I was at a conference in, in L.A., and, and Delirious was there, and they were doing this song, and I thought, dancers who dance upon injustice, that's what I want to be. And since then, maybe not as much, or maybe not so much. But dancers who dance upon injustice. We sing these songs, this particular song, in church, but is that what we really do? So what I really do. Do we seize our divine moments when they come our way by dancing on the injustices we see in our relationships, the injustices we see in our world, in our neighborhoods, in our workplace? Are we truly dancers who dance upon injustice? Will we determine to be dancers who dance upon the injustices that keep people who matter deeply to God from encountering Jesus, who pursues them just as he pursues us with a relentless tenderness? Will we put risk to faith and get in the game? Or will we be content to waste away as sideliners under the safety of our own pomegranate tree, whatever that tree may be in our lives? Not only is Jonathan going to get in the game, he also invites his armor bearer to join him on this quest. In this moment, Jonathan's circle of influence extended to one person, the guy who carried his sword and his shield. Let's go across to see those pagans, he says. And inspired by Jonathan's courage and sensing the moment himself, the armor bearer says these words back to Jonathan. Do what you think is best. I'm with you completely, whatever you decide. Now get this, the armor bearer is not saying, okay, boss, you're you're the boss. I do whatever you say. This guy was with Jonathan 100%. He could have gone back and said, you know what, here's your stuff. I'm going to go sleep with the, the other guys. But he didn't. He was inspired by Jonathan, and he said, I'm with you completely. So there they are, the two of them taking on the Philistines. If we're determined to be gamers, people who are unwilling to sit on the sidelines, people who uh, are not okay to uh, allow the injustices of life to rage all around us, if we resolve to be people who seize the divine moments when they come so that God can work through us and make a difference in the world, people in our circle of influence, however many people there may be in our circle of influence, will be inspired to get in the game too. Some of them will only move from the sidelines to get in the game if they see us get in the game first. They'll move out of the cheap seats because they thirst for something more than they're experiencing in their life. They thirst to get involved in the story of God. They thirst to get involved in advancing the cause and the gospel of Jesus. But it starts with us. If we thirst for that as well, then it takes some action on our part. It takes a willingness to get in the game. Yet there are a lot of us here who are sitting thinking, yeah, Todd, great. But this is Jonathan we're talking about, man. He was a warrior. He had royal blood. He's from the Old Testament. They all knew how to fight, you know? I'm just me. And not only am I just me, I've got responsibilities and children and a mortgage and bills to pay. Man, I can't be taking risks and entering into the danger. That all sounds awesome, but I have responsibilities, man. And you'll always have responsibilities, and so will I. I just had a baby. Don't tell me about whatever your thing is. I'll win if we compare stuff. (laughs) Maybe somebody says. Love that. Um, Jonathan had uh, everything to lose. Wealth, power, family, and the chance to be king one day, though his dad just screwed that up for him. He didn't know it yet. He risked all that stuff because he didn't want to miss the moment to make his, this moment to make his life count for something. He didn't want to miss the moment to dance upon the injustice that was staring him right in the face. 
Saul's the polar opposite of his son. Saul's identity was wrapped up in his title and his position and his throne and the stuff of being king. The fear of losing these things, and even more so now, because Samuel had said, you're, not, you're going to lose the, the, the throne because of your uh, ungodly actions. The fear of losing the throne motivated, him to, motivated Saul to do stupid things, like consulting witches and mediums to help him predict the future. Pushed him further and further away from God. He was reluctant to go into battle or to put himself at risk because he wasn't sure that he would survive, which is why we find him under a pomegranate tree while his son is going after the enemy. Does Saul sound like any of us? We may not consult witches and mediums, but how many of us would rather be safe than to be at risk for some greater purpose right now? How many of us would rather be safe than to be at risk for God's greater purpose right now? How many of us would rather know the outcome in advance than to trust that God will probably see us through, perhaps he'll see us through, but even whatever he does, it's worth it. It's worth it to get in the game here, to seize this moment that's come my way. Jonathan seized the moment by choosing faith over security, by choosing risk over assurances, and by choosing to honor God rather than to save himself. God's calling each one of us to do the same thing, and uh, I'm struck by the significance of how pitiful I am at this and how pitiful I've been at this lately. God's calling each of us to take the risk to move toward him, to be dancers who dance upon the injustices we see in the world around us. In 2 Chronicles 16, 9, the prophet Hanani says to King Asa, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth, or the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. In this moment now, in 1 Samuel 14, Jonathan catches God's eye. Jonathan's actions catch God's eye, and God gave him what he needed to win the day. Will you and I catch God's eye? And will we capture these divine moments when they come our way? Will we take the risk in order to be dancers who dance upon injustice? And will God see us and support us so that we might win the day as individuals, as a church? Will we give God the opportunity to strengthen our hearts as we desire to trust him more? Will we resist the temptation to find that nice, comfortable place to wait things out? Will we resist the temptation to be sideliners and let the gamers do all the work and live out our days in relatively insignificant safety? Will we get in the game and encourage each other to be gamers, to truly be people who dance upon injustice? Verse 11, and on and, on and on. <laughs> when the Philistines saw them coming, they shouted, Look, the Hebrews are crawling out of their holes. Then they shouted to Jonathan, Come on up here, and we'll teach you a lesson. Come on, climb right behind me, Jonathan said to his armor bearer, for the Lord will help us defeat them. That was the thing that, that once they invited them up to fight, that's when Jonathan knew that God was going to be with them. So they climbed up using both hands and feet, and the Philistines fell back as Jonathan and his armor bearer killed them right and left. They killed about 20 men in all, and their bodies were scattered over about half an acre. Just two guys. Suddenly, panic broke out in the Philistine army, both in the camp and in the field, including even the outpost and the raiding parties. And just then, an earthquake struck, and everyone was terrified. Saul's lookouts in Gibeah saw a strange sight. The vast army of the Philistines began to melt away in every direction. Find out who isn't here, Saul ordered. And when they shouted to Ahijah, bring the ephod here for the time, for at that time, Ahijah was wearing the ephod in front of the Israelites. But while Saul was talking to the priest, the shouting and confusion in the Philistine camp grew louder and louder. So Saul said to Ahijah, never mind, let's get going. Then Saul and his 600 men rushed out to, battle, to the battle and found the Philistines killing each other. There was terrible confusion everywhere. It sounds like it, right? Even the Hebrews who had gone over to the Philistine army revolted against the Philistines and joined Saul Jonathan and the rest of the Israelites. Likewise, the men who were hiding in the hills who had deserted joined the chase when they saw the Philistines running away. So the Lord saved Israel that day. How did he do it? Because Jonathan and his armor bearer seized the moment that was right in front of them. And when they seized the moment, God put uh, action behind Jonathan's faith and threw the Philistines into absurd and obnoxious confusion where, to the point where they were killing each other. 
and Israel won the day. Jonathan had made his life count for something. Even if he would have died that day, he would have died moving toward God. And this story is a picture of what life uh, should be all about for us. If we want to discover God's purpose for our lives, if we want to be people who captured the divine moments when they come our way, moments we may never get another shot at, we've got to step into the danger when those moments come. We've got to take the risk, get in the game, and follow Jesus. We have to do this knowing that it doesn't always result in a warm, fuzzy, happily ever after. We're all standing in a circle singing kumbaya ending, right? A lot of people, as I said before, a lot of people have died seizing the moment. Jonathan was one of them later in his life. He would, he would die. There are two things about this uh, story here that, that strike me. First, when we get to heaven and we interview people like Jonathan, what they'll tell us is if they had to do it over again, they would have never played it safe. If we would look at the list of people who gave their lives in Hebrews 11 for the cause of Jesus, if we interview them, they would say, you know what, if I had to do it over again, I would still not play it safe. I would still live my life attempting to advance the cause of Christ. I would still give my life for that cause. Second thing, uh, it's not like there's really any other way to live a life of faith. Because real faith, a real relationship with Jesus is laying everything on the line in order to know him, follow him, serve him. And it takes uh, entering the risk and, and danger when that's what's called for. That's a life of faith. Luke 9 says, What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? What does it profit a person if we sit under the pomegranate tree as a sideliner while the gamers do all the work? Nothing. God calls each one of us to a journey, and there's adventure in that journey for sure. There's purpose in that journey. There's significance in that journey of faith. And God doesn't give us a detailed map. Man, I wish he would. I wish he would give us a detailed map saying, this is what your life's going to look like. These are the hard times that are going to come. You know what? Most of us would freak out if we knew what was ahead of us. <laughs> it's God's grace that we don't know what's in our future. He asks us to trust him with our lives and to be ready to seize the moments when they come our way. If we live this way, we give the opportunity for God to do great things through regular people, notorious sinners like you and me. We give God the opportunity to add his power to our faith and accomplish great purposes. So where, where do we go from here? Jesse's showing up in two weeks. Is he coming into a bunch of gamers or a bunch of sideliners? I say gamers, why not? All right? And I'll say, I've seen, there are a ton of gamers in here. There are a ton of gamers in this church. I hung out last Sunday. Uh, somebody said, hey, you want to go to prison? I'm like, no. Uh, <laughs> But I, I said no like eight times, seriously. I've been here for 13 months, 13 times I think I've been asked to go to prison. I said no until this last time. And I went and uh, what I saw was, uh, I saw gamers. I, I don't know, I, I had to go to see it. I had to be there with this group of people that go every month to prison in, in two different prisons sections in, in Monroe. Uh, easy prison and scary prison. <laughs> like fences prison, bars and walls prison and they love the people that they serve it's their calling they are in the game and they are in it for the long term and uh i told barry wilbur leads this and i told barry i said man being here with you just reveals that uh this is your passion this is your calling uh and that and he's a gamer his wife's a gamer in that and uh there are people who pray in this church that are gamers there are pockets of small groups where there are gamers. There are gamers throughout this church, but not all of us are gamers right now. It's time for some of us to get off the sidelines and get in the game. And only we know where we, where we are. I gotta be honest with you, I've been more a sideliner than a gamer. People look back and go, say, Todd, you've done such a great job for us. Or Todd, we can't wait till you leave, whatever you say. <laughs> the truth is the same. Uh, I feel like I've been on the edge of, you know, one foot on the sideline, one foot on the field. And I need to get my butt on the field. And some of the rest of us do too. We need to take the risk to trust God. We need to be willing to enter into the danger, the unknown, the uncertain, 
and see what God does. And probably what God will do is move in a way that causes us never to want to be sideliners again. And may that be true for each one of us in this room, and may that be true for us as we move forward as a church far beyond my time here. In Jesus' name, amen.